Hello everyone. Welcome to this monthly webinar of Technology Enabled Learning Community of Practice. Today, we have with us Professor Michael Sankey from Australia to speak to all of us on a topic of much interest to all of us during the pandemic. With me, my co-moderator is Professor Mustafa Ajat Kamal from Bangladesh. Welcome Professor Mustafa and welcome Professor Michael Sankey. Colleagues, we are excited to see you from around the world, from Guyana to Australia. Um, and thank you very much for joining. We hope more people will be joining. And so with this small brief, I would request uh, Professor Mustafa to give uh, a brief uh, um, introduction to Professor Michael Senke. I'm sure many of you must be knowing, but as a protocol, we must introduce our guest. Professor Mustafa. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shanjay Mishra for this uh, fine introduction. Uh, Dear friends and colleagues, uh, welcome to this uh, very important webinar. This is Professor Mustafa Ajat Kamal from Bangladesh Open University. I'm the coordinator of uh, this Telco webinar series. You know, this Telco webinar series is a part of Commonwealth of Learning's Technology Enabled Learning Initiatives led by Dr. Shanja Mishra. The focus of this Telco webinars is the continuing professional development of the academics, researchers, and developers involved in technology enabled learning, OER, open and distance learning. We are truly honored to have uh, Professor Michael Shanke as the presenter in today's webinar. So tell a uh, very brief about uh, Professor Michael Shanke. I must mention that uh, Professor Shanke is the, the, the director of learning transformations at the University of Griffith in Brisbane, Australia. He specializes in uh, technology enabled learning, staff and leadership development, curriculum renewal, online pedagogies, multimodal design, which covers digital, visual, and multi -literacies. He has worked in higher education for more than 30 years. So we are really honored and we are very much eagerly waiting to listen to this uh, a uh, great personality, great academic leader. Uh, his experience will help us uh, understand how we will manage the, the online education which is going on uh, all over uh, the world. So with these few words, it's my pleasure to turn the session over to uh, Professor Michael. So Professor Michael, it is uh, your turn. You may proceed with your presentation now. Wonderful. Thank you, Mustafa, and also Sanjay for the uh, very warm introduction. I'm just going to share my screen first. And uh, there we go. Very good. So what we've, uh, what I'd, I'd like to talk about a little bit today and then open up for questions and comments and things like that is some of the lessons we've learned about having to pivot online very quickly. Um, and maybe some of the lessons we didn't have to learn if we'd taken some preliminary actions in the first instance. Let me just, uh, okay. What I'd like to just first by saying is the digital ecologies we have, and I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through, are changing. The way in which we put technology enhanced learning together is changing because we're wanting to teach. The way we're teaching is changing. Uh, very much from the sage on the stage to the guide by the side. And that is uh, a way in which we um, treat students as partners and the way in which we uh, partners in their learning journey and the way in which technology can be used to actually help that particular activity. So in doing that, we're seeing a much greater emphasis being placed on active, authentic, collaborative learning. And I'll be talking about some examples of that. And this is a way in which this uh, active, authentic and collaborative learning is one of the ways in which we have been able to deal uh, with the COVID situation, the COVID-19 situation, because we've changed the narrative around how we uh, do learning and teaching. 
To do that, though, we need to find the right tools to help us do that. And so it's based on the pedagogical foundations that we have. And again, I'll address some of those things. So in this presentation, I'm just going to briefly give you a little bit about Griffith University, where we uh, are within the sector, uh, our approach to technology hence learning, uh, the initial flurry about dealing with our uh, international students in China, about how we've upskilled our staff to deal particularly with online assessment, uh, importance of how having a quality framework in place and standards associated with that so we're not just flying blind, that we actually have uh, a set of activities, a set of standards that we know we're going to adhere to, which makes that process easier. It's very important, of course, in, in doing that, that we're investing in our people uh, because they're the ones who need to make this happen for our students. And also some lessons we've learned about not, in, in the sector that is, in, in the Australasian sector, not having to outsource our expertise in online learning. Uh, then once we've learned these lessons, how we share them, just like I'm gonna be sharing some lessons with you today, that we should all be open to be sharing with each other. And just because we've done this quickly, doesn't mean that we have to abandon our quality processes to make that happen. And so uh, in doing so, there's this thought that uh, we will uh, revisit and streamline some of the process, processes now we've made this initial shift into the online space. So Griffith University. So we are a large comprehensive metropolitan university, comprehensive university in Australian, Australasian terms means, means we teach everything from medicine uh, through to visual arts. And you can see on the map over there on the right hand side uh, that I'm over here in Brisbane, uh, which is the capital of Queensland, the state of Queensland. We have 50,000 plus students. Uh, we have six campuses and they're dotted. We deal with the southern, uh, southern area of Brisbane, right the way down to the Gold Coast, which you might have heard about. It was Gold Coast, which is all the, the lovely beaches and things. And so we have uh, five physical campuses and one virtual campus. And the virtual campus uh, has about 15,000 students associated with that. So quite a large proportion of our students are already studying some of their work online. And we are a young university. So we're just, uh, just, going, just gone 50 years old. So not, a, not an old university, uh, but we do have a very strong history in using technology enhanced learning. So you'll see the word TEL there, as you know, TEL is for technology enabled learning or technology enhanced learning, uh, either way. So as I said, we have 50,000 students, we have 4,000 plus staff. We have 20 research institutes and centers. We are ranked in the top 2% of universities in the world on the Times uh, Register. And we have about, uh, we're growing all the time, of course, 200,000 plus graduates and we offer about 200 different degree programs. Just to start with though, we, we are of course, for many years now, been using things called learning management systems. And in many senses, these learning management systems have doubled as our online classrooms. And so the problem is in many cases, we've just seen these classrooms as a place to load up PDF documents and PowerPoints and called that online learning. And of course, that's far from the truth. Uh, the, the affordances now that we have, that, well, should I say that might've been the case 10, 15 years ago before we had a whole lot of options available to us. But now, now that our ways that we want to teach and parking back to that first slide, the ways we want to teach have changed. And so the systems we need to employ need to change with that. And so over the last 10 years, particularly we've seen uh, quite a shift in the way we look to improve our online spaces and have learned a lot of lessons over that time. However, that's not to say that all our staff members have been doing that. And so despite that, we've still got thousands of staff within our sector, within the Australasian sector, who have very done little, little teaching online. And that's been a huge shift for us in moving through this, this pandemic to move all our courses online very quickly. And we've done that in a few different ways. So particularly over the last six to seven weeks, we have trained thousands of staff, well, hundreds of staff, but in our particular case, uh, over 1400 staff have been trained 
in teaching online uh, learning. Uh, again, just briefly, this is how our virtual learning environment looks. We have Blackboard as an LMS, a learning management system, but Griffith sees itself as more than just a learning management system. It is what we call a VLE, a virtual learning environment. Now, if you're in the UK, an LMS is known as a VLE, but in our particular case, a VLE is the greater suite of tools that are aligned with the learning management system. So around this uh, notion of Blackboard, which is the, the central hub of our, our learning management system, could be Moodle, could be Canvas, could be any other learning management system, we have this ecology of Office 365, and uh, particularly the use of uh, things like Stream and OneNote, and these other tools that make up this ecology. So our Echo 360 ALP, Active Learning Platform, which is a, a um, lecture recording system. <clears throat> the use of Turnitin, of course, to uh, try and detect plagiarism and cheating and things. We have uh, an ePortfolio system called PebblePad and, and a tool called VoiceThread. Uh, we use Stream and OneNote. A Stream is a video, uh, serving plat video streaming platform that is part of the Office 365 suite. And of course, OneNote is associated with that. We have very strong use of OneDrive and a very strong use now of Microsoft Teams. Around that, of course, we have uh, analytics inside the box there. We have analytics and Blackboard Collaborate, use of uh, Office 365 Teams meetings. <clears throat> we don't use Zoom, which strangely, uh, where many of the institutions in Australia do use Zoom, we don't. Uh, but that's only because we have a, a different way of approaching it because uh, we want to and I'll get into that in a sec, but the way we want to preference the use of Microsoft Teams across these environments. So we have uh, around that uh, our H5P, which stands for HTML5 package, the use of LinkedIn, LinkedIn Learning, LinkedIn Professional uh, that we, we work with our students in, other systems, and of course, YouTube and, and things like that. Across that, of course, we need to ensure that all these systems are linked back to our core corporate systems, in our particular case, our student information system, our student management system is PeopleSoft. Uh, others use other tools. So uh, they're our, our core infrastructure for learning and teaching. And of course, underlying all that is this notion of data and how we access data to help our teachers understand how our students are interfacing with their learning and teaching. We're seeing some common patterns uh, in the way in which we look at the use of these systems. So we have our Blackboard system, our learning management system, which makes up part of that virtual learning environment and their associated tools. We know that over the period of, uh, over the period of a three to four year degree, students will engage very heavily in their first and second years, particularly with this Blackboard system, but that tends to wane a bit over over subsequent years as we work, get into more work integrated learning and pracs and things like that. Um, we also know in Australia, for example, in Queensland, where we are, that Blackboard is used for uh, at schools uh, before students come to university. So all our public schools use Blackboard. Uh, and we know that that continues through to postgrad work and to some degree at the other end in the world of work, uh, many corporations use things like a learning management system to host uh, professional development, etc. However, we also uh, know that in our school system, Office 365 uh, is a very uh, strong part of the way in which the curriculum is managed. What we are seeing more and more within our ecology is that we are preparing students for the future of work. We know that most major corporations in Australasia use Office 365 in their, and particularly use of Teams, in promoting uh, communications and productivity within their environment. And so it's incumbent upon us as a university to make sure that as our students are progressing through their studies, they are fully up to speed with the types of technologies they'll be using in the workplace. We know they don't use much of an LMS, but we do know that they use a lot of this productivity cool tools, uh, such as found in Office 365, et cetera. And of course they use other workplace technologies as well, uh, such as CAD if you're an engineer or MyOB if you're an accountant and things like that. So there are a number of tools, of course, they would use 
associated with their professions as well. We have seen a change in this ecology though over recent years. And we've seen that because universities have predominantly gone from being self-hosted or cloud hosted, their learning management systems have changed to being more uh, software as a service. So the major companies like Blackboard, Canvas, uh, not so much Moodle, uh, but uh, that it is coming about in Australia as well. Uh, Blackboard is probably the most used tool next to Moodle and then Canvas and a product called D2L. But most of these major LMS providers uh, use a software as a service uh, type arrangement where we uh, updates to uh, software happens just naturally every, every month. There are little upgrades all the time as opposed to Moodle which upgrades every six months. And then maybe if, if, if you only do an upgrade once a year, that's a, a bigger change. So we're moving though, uh, at Griffith anyway, to this notion of software as service and the uh, uh, level of flexibility that gives us as uh, an institution is quite significant. Uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time working through the upgrades because they naturally happen and things. We've also seen a shift in terms of API, which is application program interface, which is still used, uh, but and not as much as it used to be, as a lot of our tools are becoming now use a standard called LTI, it's an open standard. Uh, learning, tech, learning tools interoperability is that standard. That's what LTI stands for. And so we're seeing a lot more tools adopt that to be able to make the integration uh, a lot simpler, particularly for these SaaS systems, where uh, a SaaS system doesn't allow you to do a whole lot of customization. You have to you work with the, the vendor and the way in which they present information or the, their system. So um, they use uh, what they call an LTI, learning technology interoperability for those extra tools we bring into the system. They parse information like the student numbers and uh, uh, line back to the grade books and assessment items and things like that. We're also seeing a shift in the way we teach. So we're seeing a shift from the transmission of information to more participatory creation. So more students co-creating information uh, which uh, allows us to not just uh, stand and present to students, but allows them to contribute to the garnering of knowledge. I mean, when I used to teach uh, web design and publishing, when I was in the Faculty of Education back at another university, uh, I uh, very much just delivered material and expected students to, I mean, I'm talking now 19 years ago, I used to just deliver material and expect them to consume that material and do what I asked them to do. Nowadays though, uh, particularly in the Australasian sector in England and the UK, uh, US, we're seeing a lot more participatory creation where students are helping to co-create the knowledge because we understand that lecturers don't necessarily know everything. I didn't know everything. I did not know everything about web publishing. I knew a lot, but I didn't know everything. And so that now that the internet, the world, the internet of things is out there, there is so much more information that can be garnered by students and that can contribute to their learning. And of course, in, in all that, we've moved from this walled garden approach, which is everything happens within our learning management system to much more an open garden approach where uh, we allow other systems to interface with our learning management system and allows for that much greater level of interoperability across our systems. So these are some of the things that have helped us prepare for the COVID environment, that uh, we've got the ability to uh, interoperate across these systems. So initially in the, in the initial flurry of activities dealing with China, we have about 1500 students in China online. Uh, fortunately, uh, we found that we were able to use a VPN back to our systems in Australia, a virtual private network. And that solved most of our problems in terms of students. It was a, it was a state sanctioned VPN, a China government sta state sanctioned VPN uh, called Alibaba. And that allowed us to uh, make all our systems apart from ProctorU, which is a, uh, an exam software, which is a virtual machine. It allows us to uh, interface straight into our students there. Fortunately, many made it over to Australia before uh, the pandemic hit hard. Uh, that's not going to be the case in our forthcoming semester, which starts on the 14th of July. We're going to be very much down on our international students. Normally, we have uh, about uh, 
uh, about 1,200 international, sorry, 12,000 international students. So we had 15,000 stuck in the, 1,500 stuck in China. But we have about 12,000 international students otherwise. The next thing we had to look at was uh, how we got 600 courses online really quickly. And we had to start by, and of course, once we did that, getting ready for our trimester two, which starts, as I said, on the, uh, in July. Getting on the, these courses online very quickly was uh, very crude. It was making sure that our lecturers could record their lectures and provide them online. And also then to make sure that they could do that from their house. So our Echo 360 uh, product, our lecture capture system allowed staff to be able to record the lectures in their home on their computers and being able to stream them and also participate in those uh, from uh, their home. So we didn't have to uh, get them uh, lecturing into empty uh, lecture halls and things like that. That was, the, that was the first and primary activity we had to do. And we've learned quite a few lessons about that. It's not the best way to do it. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. Uh, the, the thing was to keep it simple to start with because a lot of our staff had not been teaching online. We had to keep the steps really simple for them to start with and then lead them through this process as we get ready for our trimester two, where we'll again be teaching online. Um, we have had to uh, uh, work them from this uh, situation where they've never done it before to now they've done it once and now we start to make it a bit easier for them, talking them through ways to do that. We do that through our professional development program. One of the things we had to deal with very quickly was examinations and online assessment and particularly the notion of proctoring assessment. So at our university, uh, any, at any one time, uh, we, we start exams next week uh, for our end of trimester one exams. And we have normally run between 450 to 480 exams uh, in a proctored situation. So as a human proctor, watching the students as they do their exams. And there's usually about 400, 450 to 480 of those exams across 360 subjects. At this point, we have been able to reduce that to 40 online proctored exams, less than, less than 40 online proctored exams. Um, and then be able to make that possible for them to do that in their home. Uh, and so it's the use of remote invigilation. And we, we chose a, a product called ProctorU, though there are many other products that could be used to do that. One of the problems was if students didn't have, we found that many students, not many, but some 5% of our students didn't have access to a computer at home that was good enough to run an exam on. And so very quickly we had to think, well, okay, one of the things we'd done was loan out all the computers from our, our, our computer rooms to our students who, who uh, didn't have a, a good enough computer at home. So we loaned the students their, our computers. And then of course they have to do an exam, but not every student has good internet access at home, hasn't got a, a secure place to do it. And so we've had to look at how we can open up some spaces uh, and with appropriate social distancing to do these exams. Some universities in Australia and Aust Australasia said, no, we're not doing any exams this trimester or semester. We, we're just not going to do it. We're going to use alternate forms of assessment. Uh, there is the University of New England in Australia who runs uh, proctor, online proctor exams uh, every trimester and done that for years and years and years. And so we learned a lot of lessons from them. Uh, one of the major lessons was you just can't do this quickly. Uh, there's a whole range of issues that have to be considered when you're running online exams, not the least of which is students' concerns about privacy, uh, the, uh, the unstable internet connections and things like that. So there are some alternate things that they have done, which we've learned from along the way. Some of those are things like taking oral exams, using the mobile phone, for example, to record a student providing answers to questions. There are take-home exams, open book exams, timed quizzes and things that don't require uh, a, a, a instant uh, real-time access to a proctoring scenario. And so these are many of those 300 plus courses that have shifted away from exams have used these oral exams, take-home exams, open book exams and timed quizzes. In our case, if we're doing it, uh, an open book exam, 
we would use things like question banks. So for example, here, uh, student would start in the exam. The first question that answered be, there'd be six different versions of that question. So six multiple choice, choice uh, questions developed. Uh, and then students take a pathway through this according to uh, the way that the system uh, throws them up at different at different levels. So that makes the notion of cheating very difficult for students uh, if they're not all answering the same questions all at the same time. And so we've used this notion of a timed open book exam uh, to help students who aren't using a proctoring scenario. In Australia, in Australia, uh, our quality agency, the, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, uh, have developed what's called a guidance note around technology enhanced learning. Same as technology enabled learning, but uh, technology enhanced learning in this particular case, because we have such um, uh, well-developed systems in Australia, we've been doing this for a long time. So they have uh, provided us with some guidelines as to how they expect universities to do this, particularly in relation to fully online courses, because there are a number of people within the sector who feel that an online course is not as good as a face-to-face -face course. However, the data doesn't support that. There's some significant data, and particularly across the no significance difference research, uh, significant data to suggest an online course can be equivalent or even sometimes better than a face-to-face -face course, depending on how that face-to-face -face course is developed. Um, and so they've developed these uh, guidelines for us that we take into consideration, uh, particularly as we move fully online um, in our particular case, we can't rest on our laurels. There are a whole range of different things that need to be taken into account. And that's around the use of standards and uh, a framework. So what we do see with across the globe and not just in Australia, and it's really dependent on, on how technology enhanced learning is seen, technology enhanced learning is seen, technology enabled learning is seen, and it very much differs depending on your educational jurisdiction. Uh, the national technology infrastructure. Uh, I know in some parts of India, for example, there's no cabled internet. It's all wireless and things like that. So that's the national technology infrastructure. There are geographical constraints and uh, different levels of staff training associated with this. So we do see there's a hierarchy in a sense of uh, levels of technology and learning. We've got technology enabled learning, which is just being able to use technology to support your learning and teaching. There is technology enhanced learning, which has brought in a whole range of other tools and that, that where Griffith is at and all that interoperability across the tools. And then there's this thing called technology intensive learning, which is where we start to use artificial intelligence. We start to use a lot more uh, AR, VR, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, extreme reality into our environments. And so there are different uh, ways in which we need to assure that there are quality elements across this. And this takes us to a notion I've been working with for a while with people is this notion of the tell hierarchy and needs. And we see that at the very top level, an institution needs to have policies and procedures in place around technology hence learning. That's a must. So you must have that in place. If you haven't, then let's start talking through that notion of what that might look like in an institution. There is then uh, the way in which we translate that into practice and that's called a technology enabled learning framework. And there are things that an institution needs to have in place for the policies and procedures to outwork into the course and the programs. In Australia, in Griffith, a course is a subject or a unit of study, and our program is uh, the Bachelor of Arts or the Bachelor of Business or something like that. And then there are two levels of standards. There are standards for baseline standards at the bottom there, which across every single course, whether it's online, face-to-face, -face, blended, there are some baseline standards that all institutions have to adhere to, all courses have to adhere to. And then of course, there are those standards for fully online courses where we want to make sure there's a consistency of experience uh, for the students. One of the tools which I helped uh, Commonwealth of Learning produce uh, with Sanjay's help was uh, this benchmarking toolkit for technology enabled learning. And that is available uh, on the OASIS site. And I'll give you the link to that in a minute. And this is this toolkit that we've developed and allows us to help institutions see where they sit in relation technology and en en enabled learning uh, in the light of what's considered as good practice. And I'll look at a couple of those in a sec, but then we are able to use that 
to compare and analyze with others if we want to. So if university one is, is rating itself at a certain level within that, uh, then there's this thought that another university who's doing similar things could compare that to what they've done in the, in the technology enabled learning toolkit. Um, and so there's, this gives us a style of quality insurance that will provide our institutions with a rich, richer experience of using TEL. And the URL for that uh, toolkit is uh, on the coal site there. And of course, I'll be making this uh, slide deck available to people who uh, would like to be able to access it. And so those links are live. I'll just uh, take you there quickly. Um, here it is on the Commonwealth of Learning site. Uh, there is a Excel sheet that you can use uh, to benchmark with, or in this particular document uh, allows you to uh, let me make that a bit smaller. That's it. Um, this particular document uh, takes you through the toolkit. I'll just slide down a little bit. Sorry for the scrolling. Uh, talks about why, and then here are the benchmark domains. So there is a domain around policy. So remember I talked about policy before. Here's a domain about policy, strategic plans, uh, IT support, technology applications, etc. So there's a range of things covered in that. And the toolkit itself, if I slide down a bit further, allows you to rate where you are in your benchmark. And uh, you can see where you stand in relation to your maturity in this level. So if I was to move down into the first one, which is policy, you'd see that uh, there are, in this case, I think four, four things that need to be answered in relation to policy. So the first one is, okay, there is a well-documented tell policy at my institution. So is there? This exists in many, so I might take number four. This exists in many cases, in many areas, but not across the whole institution or this is well established across the whole institution. If it is well, you would, you would click, a, click that, you would provide a rationale for why you believe that and some evidence. Now, I'm not gonna go into that uh, in any great detail now, but I would encourage you to pull that down off the site and start to have a look and play with that instrument. And so there are the 10 domains within the, within the toolkit and these domains are indicative. So they would take you on a journey so we don't expect you to be mature in every element of that journey, but it's, a, it's a, a stage process where you would use this to help inform how you might improve your journey. There are each domain of which there are 10, there are between four to six performance indicators associated with them. And then um, the, the domains can be done in their entirety, or you can just do a couple of them if you want to. Uh, it's up to you, uh, depending on your institutional needs. If you feel as though, uh, you're not strong in the area of policy, you might look at that first domain. If you don't think you have a strong organizational culture, number seven there, uh, you might choose to do that domain, or you can do all 10 if you like, of course. It's up to you. Uh, but I know Sanjay is uh, pretty keen to work with institutions who might like to use this tool to help themselves uh, rise in the level of quality uh, that they uh, have within their institutions in terms of tell. Again, that's that URL for you. At you, you might that's at the institutional level. So, but I did mention also the notion that there are standards for fully online courses or blended courses and things like that. So, there are a number of tools in the sector, in the in the global sector, that can be used. So, Commonwealth of Learning have one, uh, which is the guide to blended learning, and there's a number of uh, indicators within that guide and that's in many senses the benchmarks uh, echo many of those uh, guidelines. Uh, there's also the Quality Matters tool, the OLC toolkit, uh, the Ascolite have a uh, what they call a, a TELAS framework which uh, Griffith University is starting to use now. Uh, JISC have one, the European Union have one and uh, Sweden have a set as well. So there are lots and lots of tools that could be used to help an individual institution run out uh, technology-enhanced learning. In our particular case, at that uh, very base level, we have our course design standards, which talk about partnership-based learning, engaging in power pedagogies, et cetera. I'm not gonna read all those out. Um, so that's the, that very base level. Then there's the TEL level, 
And then there's the benchmarks and things at that level. I did talk about how we prepared students, uh, staff, sorry, for moving online quickly. And so you'll see here, uh, back in May, we were running on average 11 workshops a week uh, in terms of developing course curriculum, uh, developing course profiles, uh, designing your curriculum. First, we started though with just getting your lectures online. How do I get my lecture online? And so we had literally hundreds and hundreds of staff attending these virtual workshops, just like I'm doing a, a virtual workshop here. Um, in that, we are also now starting to see that we've, there are a whole suite of staff that have been upskilled. Now, the reason we were able to do this is because Griffith had in place and had done some benchmarking before, and we had a whole lot of these elements in place. And that's the beauty of the benchmarks, that if you are putting yourself through that discipline to start with, you set yourself up better for when you hit crisis situations like this. This is not going to be the only pandemic we have in the future. There's going to be others in the future. And so uh, that's what the experts are telling us at least. And so we need to be setting this time aside to prepare ourselves for uh, the future of technology enhanced learning. And so by doing things like the benchmarking activity, we can prepare ourselves uh, for that. So as I said, our first lectures, our online le our tutorials were around uh, the use of uh, getting lectures online and the use of Microsoft Teams. Then we shifted our forums to um, online assessment and things like that. Uh, and now we've look, been looking at uh, design and analytics. So for example, this week, this week, uh, so today at 11 o'clock we ran prepare your uh, learning materials and activities. We had 44 registrations for that. You can see on Thursday, I've got 75 registrations, 67 registered for these different workshops we're running uh, for our staff. It's really important that we upskill our staff very quickly. We have developed very quickly a COVID-19 uh, learning teaching support resources site based on Office 365 SharePoint, uh, which is uh, dealing with uh, uh, helping our learning community work with each other, our academics working with each other, uh, their workshops, the support line we've, we've implemented. So telephone support for academics uh, and things like that. So very quickly pivoted to supporting our staff in this environment. However, some institutions haven't been as well prepared for this, not just because they haven't done any benchmark or anything, but they've outsourced a lot of their expertise to other people. So within the sector, we have things like edX, Coursera, uh, KeyPath, FutureLearn, uh, Online Education Services, NAVDA. These are companies that have taken, have worked with predominantly face-to-face -face institutions and put their courses online for them. And all the online learning experience resides with these companies. And so we've taken, a, we've on-sold a lot of our skills. And for, fortunately, we didn't do that at Griffith. So we've had a number of uh, we've worked closely with some of these partners, but we've kept the uh, integrity of our courses to ourselves, not outsourced that uh, expertise. And so many of these companies were used by institutions to get their online courses up there quickly. But it is time now to invest in our own abilities and expand our capabilities in this area. But it doesn't mean we uh, get rid of quality. Um, we, let's face it, the first things we put up weren't elegant. They were not elegant at all, but we need to now circle back, uh, particularly around things like, uh, and online assessment suffered initially, but then we've started to train student uh, staff up in how to do better assessment online. So there are a number of online communities around. Uh, this is a particular one I'm involved, which is called Transforming Assessment, uh, which is uh, a special interest group of the Ascolite group, uh, which was mentioned in my introduction. Um, and that's a, a dot com site. There's very, very uh, open workshops to, for anybody to attend. Uh, we have strong participation from the UK uh, and across Australia, New Zealand, and uh, some Southeast Asian countries as well. Um, and basically, it's about designing assessment for usability you know, you know, you know, through universal design. Okay. It's important though, in the use of technology, that we're driving this notion that it's not about technology. It's about the way in which we facilitate pedagogical scenarios, the teaching scenarios. So the uh, technology is just the 
the cart that we use. The pedagogy is the horse that pulls the cart. And so, but over the years, we've had a tendency to have us driven by the technology, not by the horse. It's much more efficient for the horse to pull the cart than to push the cart. So technology holds, doesn't hold all the answers, but it does hold quite a few. And so we need to look at ways in which we can do that. And some of the ways we do that is through different forms of pedagogies, different forms of uh, instructional types. Now, uh, we have evolved in many cases in online pedagogy to this thing called paragogy, hudagogy and paragogy. Now, I don't want to go into any length at that. If you would like to know more about that, I've put up a post um, and you'll get the link to this called putting the pedagogic horse in front of the technology cart. I haven't got time to deal with that now, but it is a, a blog post I put up based on an article I wrote for the open, uh, the, the distance education journal in China. And this is an English version, if you would like to do that, or you can access the Chinese version. In that I'm proposing that a ways in which we deal with COVID particularly is through things like active learning. That's where we're engaging students at an analytical level and seeking to facilitate students to assimilate material information rather than in a passive absorbing through traditional lectures and things. And so we design tasks such as uh, active discussions. We use live debates. We use problem solving. We use case-based learning, simulations and role play. So these things can all be facilitated through the online space, through Zoom and through Microsoft Teams meetings and things like that. These uh, excellent activities to do that are very active for students and start to minimize the notion of cheating and plagiarism. So it's very easy for a student to cheat in writing an exam, an essay. It's a lot harder for them to cheat if they're doing a live debate or doing problem solving with other students or working, developing simulations and things. Very hard for them to cheat in that area. Similarly with collaborative learning, it relies, and there's a lot of crossovers in these, it's about engaging groups of students. So it makes it harder for, again, harder for students to cheat if they're working in groups and there's a, res and a responsibility for them to be participating uh, with two or three or more other people. And so we can integrate that into our teaching programs through things like peer modeling and getting students to role play, uh, doing scavenger hunts, uh, doing debates again, uh, a past the problem scenario which is where students partly answer a question and pass on to the next student to help answer the question. Or forming groups, creativity groups, where students brainstorm solutions to difficult problems. That's collaborative learning. Then authentic learning, students gain experience by doing. There was, I don't know how many times we hear that now. Students learn by doing rather than just listening and absorbing and they're observing. So it's, it's more a case of getting them to get involved in that in that process, encouraging to think critically through different and evaluate information to uh, build professional identity. And so we do that through uh, posing an ill-defined problem that's not easily solved. It's about tasks to allow sustained uh, investigation. It's allowing multiple sources and perspectives, reflection, perspectives from various disciplines. So if you're studying business, what's the perspective of physics or science, nursing or whatever it is on this, is it the same or is it different? And getting students to investigate from different perspectives, uh, their, their discipline based perspective, uh, assessment that is more integrated creation of products and problems that have many possible solutions and getting students to debate which is the best solution. So this is my last slide and we're talking through this notion that we are in this together so just like i'm sharing some of these ideas with you i uh, you should be encouraged to share as much as you can with other people most of us are very willing to share i mean i've spent a number of weeks uh, providing uh, online workshops and things like that to to people and uh, people are very much appreciating that it's about connecting with people it's about looking for people you trust that you already know uh, lots of people are putting stuff online. So I put up that blog about putting the pedagogic horse in front of the technology cart. Well, who am I? There's so much stuff out there that uh, is rubbish. Uh, hopefully that thing I put up is not rubbish, but there is a lot of rubbish out there. So we've got to be careful. Uh, and so we need to be looking for trusted sources for information. Uh, we don't want the fake news. So we know that there you have your community of practice. There are 
are people you can naturally uh, uh, work with within your community of practice. I'm also involved in a group called the Teleadvisors within Australia, which is the Technology Hence Learning Advisors. Uh, there is, of course, our Escalite, which I'm involved in. There's just the heaps of resources around that, and of course, Educores, and of course, not the least of which is, of course, the coal resources as well uh, through Oasis and things. So there's lots of things that we need to be doing uh, that are from trusted sources and that we can be sharing this information with each other and learning from each other at this time. So I think that's probably chewed up more to about the 45, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. So I'll stop sharing this and open it up to uh, questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sankey. And it's, it's really um, going to a long discussion on lots of issues, lots of technologies. Some places access to technology is a, is a challenge during this time. Some yes. places the mindset needs to change, particularly to adapt online assessment or alternative forms of assessment, if not online yes. assessment as such. So there are lots of things for us to do. Um, of course, we'll keep discussing about these topics and keep learning from each other. With Wonderful. that, I would thank all the participants and Professor Sankey and Professor Mustafa to close this session today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.